Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Today we've got Ryan Shroud here and he's going to tell us all about overclocking. Welcome to Know How. This is Twit's How To Show. We tell you lots of fun projects you can do on your own. Leo Laporte, not in. I'm Aya Zaktar. We've got Ryan Shroud here. You've seen him on Twit, PC Per, This Week in Computer Hardware. And uh, you know everything there is about overclocking, I assume, because that's why we brought you here. I wouldn't say I know everything, but obviously I guess I know more than you since you brought me here. Well, yes, right? that, that is very true. Yeah. You are the expert. And he is quite quick-witted. <laughs> No, but seriously, on, on this, this whole thing. Now, you have a machine here that's already been overclocked. Can you explain what overclocking is and why you would do it at all? So overclocking essentially just means taking a processor, either a CPU or a GPU, or you can overclock lots of things, and running it above specified rates, right? Mm -hmm. So higher clock speeds uh, equal more performance, equal uh, uh, more throughput, like you can overclock, sometimes you can overclock storage devices, you can overclock monitors to have higher refresh rates, you can overclock all kinds of stuff. But I think when people think of overclocking, they mainly think of processors. They sometimes think, so, think of GPUs too. So when you start doing that though, you're gonna take a processor, it's got a, a rated speed of like 2.5 gigahertz. Right. You're gonna make this run faster than it says on the actual label. Now, how do you actually go about doing that in the software side, because you're not going to be flipping switches over here. You used to do that in the day. There used to be jumpers and dip switches on motherboards that you would change. Uh, and I remember the very first time we started getting into software-based overclocking, uh, it, it was it was it was mind blowing because you could just go into BIOS now and change a couple of options, and suddenly your processor would run faster. And now today, I, I still think the most popular way to do it is with inside the BIOS, inside well, what they call now the UEFI, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere where you control any of those settings. It's, it's the most uh, responsive way to overclock. You get the most options. But the other way is you can go into software and do it. And Asus and MSI and Gigabyte, they all have Windows-based software that you run that basically gives you almost the same kind of control in Windows mm -hmm. that you do uh, in, the, in the UEFI. And there's a couple of caveats, but mostly identical. Now, is there any particular processors you have to get? Are there any particular pieces of hardware that you should be aware of before you even try to, to overclock, or is this something you can do with any piece of hardware? You can overclock pretty much anything. It's just a matter of how much overclocking you want to do uh, and, and, and how far you want to push it, right? So in this particular case, we're using uh, an Asus P8Z77V Premium motherboard. It's really... Of course, it, it looks like that, too. It, it's an expensive it motherboard. It really is. It's high because it's got a Thunderbolt connection on it. It's got this uh, micro S uh, or mini SSD in the shot as well. Um, and it's, it, it's a high-end board. It will do overclocking very well. But you can overclock with pretty much any motherboard from the Asus line, from the MSI line, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in terms of the processor, you can overclock with any Ivy Bridge processor out there, but it's easier if you have a K-series part. If you have a 3770K or 3570K, the K indicates that they're unlocked parts. You can adjust the multipliers on them, which is one of the components of overclocking. Uh, without oh, that's the K on your shirt. You're also unlocked? Yes, I'm that, also. That's very good. Yeah, that All helps right. me get home quicker. <laughs> okay, so how do you actually get into, what kind of software do you recommend when you're gonna go into the Windows 8 side of this? Because you're using a Windows 8 machine here. Yeah, I just, we just put a Windows 8 on this machine to, for, for demonstration purposes. It doesn't matter if you're on Windows 7 or anything like that. Okay. Um, so for, we're, we're using this ASUS software here. And let me uh, minimize this out of the way. And, and this does it actually come with a motherboard? It does. Okay. Yeah. So this will ship on the, on the CD or the DVD that comes in it, and then you can download the latest versions from ASUS's website. And this is Turbo V Evo. It's part of uh, their whole AI suite uh, set of tools. And if you look here, you can see there's all kinds of settings, B clock frequency, CPU voltages, DDR voltages, and then all these other numbers. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. I almost never change the majority of these settings. You, there's very little you have to do. If you're just trying to get, you know what, I've got this part, I spent this money, let's get some extra free performance out of it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to change much. Uh, if you, It's not until you get into like really, really hardcore overclocking. You get into LN2 overclocking. You get it into people that 
do this almost competitively where you need to start worrying about these very specific things for channel A, channel for B voltages. voltages and things. Yeah. So what are, the, what are the settings that people should be looking at if they're just starting out? The main things you want to look at are B clock frequency, which is your base clock, and that's kind of like uh, what used to be called the front side bus. Mm -hmm. And it is mixed with a multiplier, or what they call here a CPU ratio. And so our CPU ratio currently is running at 38. 38x is essentially what you would call that. And it gives you kind of a, a calculated frequency here of 3.8 gigahertz. And that's what it would run at, you know, if it was full speed um, based on all of the settings that you have. Now, if we go here, you can see this base clock is currently set to 100.5 megahertz. So you multiply 100.5 times 38 and you get 3,819. The math actually works out pretty simply. Um, so what you'll want to do is adjust the, uh, the, the ratio. Adjust the ratio. Adjust the ratio and here. And all you, can, all you have it's to do slider. is move a slider. Okay, so you're adjusting a ratio. Right, and notice, notice how the frequency is changing, right? So if I push up to 56, which I would never work in this configuration, you know, you could theoretically get 5.6 gigahertz. Why wouldn't it work in this configuration? That's too far. It's too far to push this processor with this type of cooling, with the voltages that, we're, that okay. I feel safe running at. And so that you could kind of damage stuff. the processor if you try to do this too More than crazily. likely it would just crash and you'd reboot and you wouldn't have any success. Well, that's, that's not what you want to overclock. No, no. So, but how far, how, your, how do you know how far you can go then? It's all experimentation, right? Okay. So there's two ways to do it. You go, you go into forums, you go into all kinds of different groups, and, and you see what are other people doing with similar hardware, with your processor and your motherboard. What should you expect to get? And then you kind of start there, and you maybe go down a little bit if you're more concerned about stability, or maybe you go up a little bit if you're more concerned about performance and that kind of stuff. So, and there, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see. So what, what we did was we kind of pre-tested everything and we you can create profiles in software that's one of the cool things about having the software is you get other advantages that you get with windows software as opposed to just working in, in a bios constantly restarting and doing yeah. that you can just do that in software so here. we you know we saved a profile already at 4.5 gigahertz and here's what it did it changed the base clock up to 103 megahertz which okay. isn't a lot but base clocks are pretty sensitive with sandy bridge and ivy bridge processors so that's that's pretty normal um, we moved the CPU voltage from 1.235 to 1.290. And that's really the only of the, I would say the three things you should consider changing. It's your base clock, it's your ratio, it's your voltage, your primary CPU voltage. And I even recommend not increasing the voltage until you start to see instability. Right? You want to keep your voltage as low as possible because that means lower temperatures. That means you, know, you can use quieter fans, you can turn the fan levels down. And you only want to increase in voltage until you find that stable spot. And what we kind of found was, is as we crept up, 1.29 was, was pretty good. And When go you're ahead. testing these things out, I mean, are you just messing with the sliders and then just running your system normally and seeing what happens? Or, or is there something you can do to test it right away? So what you want to do is you want to use some kind of stress test, something that pushes 100% of the processor and memory or graphic card, whatever you're overclocking. So you can try to find those inconsistencies right away. Because okay. what you don't want is two days down the line, it to crash while you're working on a document or something like that and you lose some data. Um, so um, what I'm going to do here, go ahead here is, uh, let's see, if I change it to, to the, our 4.5 profile, our ratio is actually at 44, and I'm going to hit apply here, and it's going to tell me that it could cause system instability, but I'm okay with that. That's just default warning for everything. So you don't need to take restart though right now. It's you don't have gonna... to restart. Okay. Um, <clears throat> There are, some, there are some settings you have to restart for, like uh, the first time you enable the ability to change the uh, CPU ratios, okay, that you makes have to sense. reboot, right? Because that's actually, uh, it's fundamentally something different in the processor when it starts up for the first time, so the system needs to reboot. So it applied, it took a couple seconds. So it applied it. Now what you'll notice here, keep an eye on this, this is our CPU frequency. We're only running at 1.6 gigahertz. That doesn't seem close to 4.5, does it? Not yet, at least, my, so, at least my, I'm sure I can read, that's not close to 4 yet. <laughs> This application, ADA64, very popular with overclockers, benchmarking, and that kind of stuff. It has a, it has a tool called the System Stability Test. And you can check mark here, processor, cores, and all that kind of stuff. And what this is going to do, this is going to throw a bunch of math at the CPU cores and make them run up to 100% CPU utilization. And what we'll see is the clock speed will increase here. Now, everything starts to happen a little bit slower as well because when your CPU is 100% utilization... Because that jump from 1.6 to 4.5 right. in a heartbeat. So now you, you get to see we're running at 1, 1. 1.3 uh, base clock, 44, and we're at the 4.5 gigahertz. You'll also see our temperatures will go up. 
that's something else. So what, what is this piece of software here, this panel you This have? is actually part of ADA 64. This is okay. kind of a monitoring thing where you can keep an eye on individual core temperatures, your fan speeds. Uh, it also kind of gives you your clock rates and that kind of thing. And you know, this is a good point to mention. Temperatures are very important when you overclock. You don't want to get them too high. You notice this CPU cooler we're using is a Corsair uh, H100i. And it's a self-contained water cooler. It's a pretty high-end unit. It's probably $130 or something like that. Uh, and what it does is it has a, a water pump in there. And it has liquid, fluid, reservoir, and then radiator and fans. And it's actually kind of like the old school water cooling component, uh, configurations, but all self-contained. You don't have to worry about bleeding out system, getting out air bubbles or anything like that. They're a little bit less efficient, but they're way more convenient than water cooling used to be, which is really nice. Now, they're, they're, if you had like a base system, you're like, I'm going to overclock this, and it has uh, one of those old little air cool systems and potentially even a power supply that doesn't seem so powerful. Are yeah. these, what, what should you be thinking about when you're talking about overclocking? You're going to need more power. You're going to need more cooling. Can you do that with anything, or should, do you recommend switching things? So if you're using like a stock Intel heat sink that kind of ships with the processors, don't use that. Okay. That's probably one of the worst heat sinks we've ever actually the used. The stock Intel ones? Yeah. They because work for that the, speed. Exactly. They're 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 going to guarantee they're guaranteeing that it's going to work at its default clock speeds and stay within whatever That's temperature. Probably it. Right. And, and they can get away with making a cheaper part. They're going to do it. Makes um, sense. But I mean, in reality, you can get thirty, forty, and fifty dollar heat sinks, not water cooled systems. Corsair sells some. There's tons of companies that do though um, that are just slightly larger heat sinks with slightly larger fans, and they'll they'll do a pretty good job. This is a fairly high end solution right and I mean we're running at 4.5 gigahertz which is about 20 percent overclock of what this processor would normally be at and we're running the CPUs at full throttle so to speak and we're at 57 degrees Celsius on on the cores and that's really really good if you're in the 70s that's still comfortable. I mean, so you'll see the these 50s, bars change good. color, right? When the, I saw it go to yeah. yellow at some point. Yep see there's a 60c spike and it goes to yellow um, and it, it's it's just, an, it's just a nice tool to, to kind of keep, keep in mind uh, your safety margins. What about the cost savings? I mean, you could get a, a faster processor. You could probably do that. I mean, this seems to be one of the latest uh, uh, yeah. motherboards you can get, so the latest processors. But if you had an older machine, is there a real cost savings on getting a new processor versus doing all this yourself? I would say probably not anymore. Right, so there, there's an argument to be made that if you buy the, the highest end Ivy Bridge is a 3770K, it's $350 or something like that. It's gonna run as fast as you need for, for pretty much everything for most of the time. You can buy less expensive parts, and you can overclock them, um, but they're not that much less expensive. You know, even if we jump down to some of the more mid-range parts, you only talk about $100 difference on the CPU side at most, but then if you invest 50 of that back into a newer cooler, is the $50 savings really worth it? I think more of what it is is buy the parts that you're comfortable and you're, you can afford. And then if you're a little bit adventurous, you don't have to be that, you don't even have to be that adventurous, but if you know, you're like, okay, these are the parts I could buy, but I'd like to get more performance out of it, do a little bit of overclocking. And you don't have to have this cooler on it. And, and I would think the majority of, of PC builders don't use that stock Intel heatsink to begin with. So you can, you can still play around. Most, I don't want to, Oh, okay, so we've actually we had the system turn off. Now, why did that just happen? I honestly don't know. Oh, here it goes. It's rebooting. It's I think rebooting. I, I think I turned off the, uh, the overclock stuff. I, I had just stopped the stability run, so we'll see what happens when it comes back up. Okay, but this happens. I mean, this when you're testing these, these systems, this this will happen occasionally. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of that. I mean, this is one of those uh, arguably because you can kind of situations. I, I love. I used to look into this. I used to see the motherboards that go into liquid nitrogen, these yes. crazy things to cool it, or actually maybe not into it, but it was cooled by it. And then there was like the mineral oil ones, lots of different ways to keep your system super cool. Yeah. But this seems very, very neat. It is. And, and, and there's, it's, it's neat and it's easier. It's way easier than it's ever been. I, you know, people always ask me, do you overclock still? And, and, and in reality, I still do, but I don't consider it overclocking because it's so much more simple than it used to be. Um, I mean, you just saw like worst case scenario, we had a power supply surge or something like that and it just rebooted. And now that we've rebooted and opened up these applications, it's gonna tell you exactly where you're at again. You're, you don't have to go into the BIOS or the UFEI and, and test a bunch of things. Uh, and, it, and all these software tools just make it more simple to do.
So we've got software tools. This makes it, yeah, this looks so different. I mean, when I used to look at this years ago, yeah. it was all biospace stuff, and you had to test and restart, lots of those things. You didn't know what was going to happen, but you have this software that came with the motherboard. That also seems strange to me at this point, but that's so easy. And then you have all these tests that you can try out. Yep. And so what about the power supply? Any issues with that if you are overclocking? Um, I'd say for the most part, not really. Uh, you want to have a high quality power supply. You don't want something that's kind of inexpensive, not inexpensive, I'll say cheaply built. Um, is there a brand you would recommend overall? You know, this is an Antec. They make good power supplies. The Corsair makes good power supplies. You know, uh, Seasonic makes good power supplies. There's a whole lot of good ones. If it's a name brand and you can find reviews of them online, chances are it's going to be good enough for this. It, power supplies are much more, uh, more important when you start getting into overclocking graphics cards that can pull 300 plus watts at a time, whereas processors are a little bit more lower key than that, I guess I would say. Have you used the software at all to underclock to get uh, better performance, not better performance, but less, uh, more power savings? Because, I mean, this is obviously going to take up a lot of power. Yeah. If you wanted it to run at a cheaper cost for electricity purposes, have you ever bothered doing that? We, we definitely have, and, and that's, you know, some of the features of some of the, I guess, advertised features of processors is the ability to undervolt. Um, I don't, we haven't exper experimented with this particular CPU, but the idea would be to lower your CPU voltage as low as you could while still running at some performance level that you're comfortable with. Thereby, and it's not just power savings, but you can run your fans at slower speeds. Maybe you could get close to a completely passive, silent system that way as well, which is something that a lot of PC builders kind of strive for. If you get into, you know, small form factor, uh, ultra quiet PCs. AT PCs where they're sitting over there yeah, in the living room. They're going to look into undervolting and still getting performance levels. And that's why, you know, sometimes you even buy a, a higher end processor to down clock because they have a little bit more headroom on terms mm -hmm. of their voltage fluctuation. Um, and, and that's actually one of the things kind of off topic that Intel is working on on the process technology side is how can we run processors at lower voltages because their goal is to get into tablets and smartphones and that kind of stuff. So their, their whole push kind of going forward is running processors at good speeds, lower voltages. So when you go to actual overclocking, not underclocking, when you're doing overclocking, what applications have you found are getting this, the best performance out of these, these tweaks. You're getting more speed out of your CPU. What's the actual real world usage for somebody? It's not just gaming, because that's more on the GPU at this point. Right. What, what is the, the CPU intensive thing that you're like, this is why you do it? So you, you get into the obvious ones, video encoding, video transcoding, uh, video editing. Uh, anytime you're doing development work, um, there's a lot of benefit you get out of CPU overclocking. Anywhere where you're looking at your processor and your um, uh, let's see if that comes up. Here we go. Oh, it's Windows 8, so it's all different now. So we're looking for the CPU usage. Yeah, here. anytime your CPU utilization is 80 or percent or above, overclocking your processor is going to get you more benefit. You know, we we personally had a super high-end Halem 6-core single CPU system that we were running for our video streaming setup, and we had all kinds of Skype instances and stuff going on it, and we were hitting a CPU bottleneck. So we overclocked that part from 3.6 to 4.2, and now it can handle the, the, the load that we need for, for that purpose. Uh -huh, so we'll trap you downstairs to overclock all the Skype machines at right. Twitch. That'll definitely help us out yeah. in, the long, in the long run, because if that's the bottleneck, why not? I mean, you look at all, there's the, the new trend for PC gamers is to stream their gameplay sessions on Twitch.tv mm -hmm. or Justin TV or whatever it is, and, and, and that actually uses a ton of CPU utilization, because not only are you running the game, but now you're running video encoding and you're streaming and you're running some piece of software as the in-between to maybe do your picture-in-picture -picture and all that kind of stuff. So now people, you know, you're starting to realize that the, the idea of 18 months ago or 24 months ago that was, ah, uh, all the processors are fast enough for anything you want to do may not be the case. Yeah, I mean, I've done a number of screen records. I'm doing video things or I'm trying to do a stream at the same time from yep. my home machine. It's a relatively old machine, but it should be able to handle it but then it starts getting choked and choked and choked. But this kind of thing, we get some eke out some more performance for older machines, I would as assume as well. Yeah, every little, every little bit that you add to it, it you, Skype uses, every Skype video instance takes up space and or CPU cycles and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's I don't, not everybody needs to overclock, um, but it's, it's, it can be easier actually. And there's, there's something in here and all the vendors have a version of this. They have something called auto tuning. I won't run it because it takes a little bit of time um, where you click this button and the software increases your base clock, increases your multiplier, and it runs a test, and then it does it again, it runs a test, it does it again, it runs a test, until it crashes. Okay. And then it reboots, and the software starts again. 
and it says, okay, that's where I crashed. Let's go do this again. So it tries to automate the process. So instead of you messing with the sliders be, right. all the time, it'll do it by itself. Right. And it usually can't get quite as high as what you will do manually if you're kind of a modestly experienced overclocker. But for somebody in terms of ease of use, just kind of click the button and you can kind of walk away for a half an hour and come back and, you're, and the system will have a, a box up on there that says, we decided you can run at 4.3 gigahertz, congratulations, right? Click save or cancel. When did it become that easy that you could just, okay, run the software, hit the one click, walk away, and it'll figure it out on its own, wow. Motherboard vendors, I mean, that's, that's their differentiation point at this, at this time, right? So chipsets are all the same. You can't really differentiate in terms of actual performance back and forth anymore. So they, they look for these interesting user interface kind of tweaks. MSI has their, um, what they call it, the OC Genie button, which is literally a button oh, yeah, it's on, on, the actual motherboard. on the board that you just push, and it takes about three extra seconds to boot the first time, and it's running an overclock set. Is that the one that actually has the little switch in case you screw up? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's yeah. an awesome motherboard. I've seen it a couple of times, yeah. and yeah. Is there any, any other tips or tricks about overclocking? I mean, it, it seems really simple. It's, it, you've got to make sure, though, you have proper cooling, no right. matter what you're doing, because yep. that CPU is going to get hot because you're making it run faster than it was supposed to, mm -hmm. at least marketed at. Anything else? I mean, you need to have patience. If, if, if it's your first time doing it, you know, things like a reboot, it's going to happen, right? So if you run your stability test like ADA 64, something like that, and it runs great for 30 minutes, but as it turns out, you, you need to run something like this for, so for like our production machine, we ran ADA for 24 hours. 24 hour ran, testing. Ran 24 hours without crashing, and I go, okay, you know what, I'm confident that that's, that's a reliable system. Um, for some people, that's as far as they need to go. For others, they get the, you know, eh, it ran for 30 minutes, I'm fine with that. All I'm doing is gaming anyway. Worst case scenario, it crashes and, you know, I lose that round of multiplayer Battlefield 3 Sounds or something like Sounds like lots of swearing that. to happen right after that. It could, it could. I mean, and it's, it's, it's also kind of a fun thing to do. Some people like to work on their cars. Some people like to work on their computers. Some people don't want to do any of that and they just want stuff to work out of the box, right? So you still have those options, right? And it's there's just there's tons of options and, and capabilities for that well this is a fantastic primer on how to overclock how to do all these things ryan if, if people wanted to find you on the internet how could they possibly find i mean you know about the internet right i have i yeah, i've started to read about it uh -huh. uh, i've done a little research books, i've got a couple right? of books on like how to code HTML, so I'm looking forward to putting up a website. Um, the URL that I want to put it at is, is pcper.com. You know, it's weird. I think there is a pcper.com. It looks like that. Oh, hey, look at that. I know those guys. Uh, so yeah, that's we do. We focus on hardware. We do reviews of processors and motherboards and graphics cards and that kind of stuff. Our big deal over the last little bit of time is uh, a frame rating story. So we've completely changed the way we test graphics cards to look at hardware capture of things. It's I wrote like an 18 thousand word article on how graphics testing has changed over the last two years. Okay, in those 18,000 words, did you talk about tearing and, uh, and all those things? Going we talk on? about v-sync tearing, we talk okay. about uh, stuttering in games. So that, if you want to know anything about it, that's, that 18,000 words is probably pretty comprehensive. If it doesn't answer your question, send me an email and I may or may not reply to and it. And if people want to send you an email, maybe <laughs> follow you on Twitter, where can they find you on Twitter? Twitter is at Ryan Shrout, pretty simple. Well, Ryan, that was fantastic. This, I didn't realize how easy it had become, and it actually shows up with your motherboard at this point, at least yep. if you buy this one. Uh, I think that pretty much does it for us at Know How. We do this show every week on Thursday around 3 o'clock Pacific. Uh, you can send us an email if you want to, knowhow at twit.tv. If you've got show ideas, send them there. If you're a Google Plus community, a lot of folks are there helping out each other. So I have saw a bunch of things, people trying to figure out how to do DNS settings. It's like... It's kind of like a forum, those communities. I know it's crazy they're to call still them. There? They're still around, forums? Google, well, they call them communities now, around. Google+. Plus. Ours <laughs> is at gplus.to slash twitkh. So if you want, join that, that, that group. It's over 2,000 people in there helping out each other. Right. It's a great resource. We also post uh, episodes in there. And I don't know why my face is up there. Somebody decided to, to post uh, my latest Google Plus post. So you'll see my shining face, because it's <laughs> actually a little too shiny. I should have done something about that. Anyway, now that you know how, to uh, overclock, go to it. <laughs>